Tonight, we're going to talk about death. Now, this is a really wide area of philosophy. There's a lot, a lot of literature on a lot of different aspects. I included some, some articles on medical ethics topics, right? On physician-assisted suicide. I included some more existential sort of reflections on things. And I'm going to draw from a lot of different philosophical traditions to talk about death. And because the sources, I guess, are not all necessarily talking about the same perspective on death, I'm going to try to drive home like three different lessons, and I'll make it explicitly clear. But I think that one thing that a lot of these writings that I assigned, at least for tonight, have in common is that they're all really beautiful and all in, in certain ways very heavy and difficult to understand. So um, this lecture is probably going to be heavy. And uh, hopefully, you know, you're in a good frame of mind. But if you're not, uh, I would totally recommend reaching out to your friends, reaching out to the counseling center on campus. Um, if, if you need, you know, just try and find help in, in case this gets too heavy. But hopefully, my hope is that these reflections on death will help you to live better, right? That's why they're kind of being included in this particular class. And that's also why I chose to include uh, this artwork in particular. It's a skull, and, and if you were to, to turn it around, it's actually a, like a chair on the other side, but it's by this really wonderful artist named uh, Okuda San Miguel. Um, he's from Spain. And I like this artwork in particular because on the one hand, it is morbid, kind of like our topic. We're talking about death. But on the other hand, it's vibrant and it's lively and i hope i hope that that's what the discussion tonight is able to help us to do so the first thing that i think we need to talk about is the fact that death gives life meaning okay and the way that we talked about this was through the work of bernard williams and bernard williams is a very famous philosopher uh, recently deceased influenced a lot of different areas of philosophy. You might, re you might remember his name, potentially, from some of the counterexamples or thought experiments against consequentialism. The article that we read for tonight wasn't actually his. His is nice. But Felipe Perea, he, uh, he, he wrote a summary. And so that's kind of what I'm, I had y'all read, but I think that it's a great summary. So let's kind of go through this to see what Bernard Williams meant. First is, his thesis is basically that immortality, the ability to live forever, is undesirable, right? You shouldn't choose to be immortal. If you were given the option, you shouldn't choose to be immortal. And this might seem kind of far-fetched, but maybe it's not. You know, medical technology is increasingly better in the future. A lot of Computer scientists are speculating that we might be able to download our consciousness into a machine. Bernard Williams is cautioning us against these types of things. You shouldn't want to be immortal, right? And why is that? Well, it's largely because there's a dilemma that he sets up from this paper. And before I get into the argument, I should say what a dilemma is. So what a dilemma is, it comes from the Greek word meaning two, D, lemma, horns. So you have two horns. And the idea is that either way, you know, you're going to get skewered by one of the horns. So what a dilemma does is it tries to say you have two options or three options or four, it doesn't matter. And every single option leads to something bad. And that shows that there's a problem with your philosophy or with your argument, because the dilemma says all of your options are bad options. So that's what he's trying to set up with respect to immortality. So the first horn of the dilemma is basically that, look, if we're immortal, we eventually satisfy all the desires that give our lives meaning. And if we satisfy all of the desires that give our lives meaning, we just get bored. Or, or maybe there are certain desires that we aren't able to satisfy. Maybe no matter how much I try, 
I'm not able to be a star running back in the National Football League, right? So that could lead to a lot of frustration or me just giving up on certain things. And he's going to say, given that, that doesn't look like something that we should desire, right? It seems like part of the beauty and the meaning of life is being able to desire certain things and being able to choose among them. And our finitude forcing us to choose among certain things seems to make it really special whenever we accomplish something, right? And I think that's the first thing. If we're immortal, meaning in life looks very, very different. And it looks very, very different because we end up satisfying all of our desires or giving up on the things that we thought were desirable. So we just kind of lose lots of elements of meaning in our life. The second horn is basically, okay, so, so maybe we don't have any of these desires. Um, but the other thing that's really strange about being immortal is, okay, I live right now and I have certain things that give my life meaning, uh, staying close to my family, you know, giving my dog a good life, teaching my students very well, writing philosophy, hanging out with friends, those types of things, right? But consider what I would be like 500 years into the future. There's a pretty good chance that all of those things, they just, they won't be operative desires for me anymore. And whoever I am far into the future is not going to share any similarities or desires with who I am right now. And given that, basically neither one nor two looks desirable. If you had to make the decision today whether or not you wanted to be immortal, either one, you're resigning yourself to a life of boredom and a very strange way of considering meaning. So why would you do it for that reason? Or two, you're considering something that's so deeply transformative of yourself that you can't even really consider what that would be like. So either way, it just doesn't make sense to be immortal. This is what Bernard Williams is trying to get us to see. Now, there are certain counterexamples and... Uh, that's the characterization that we read today updated William's argument with a lot of people in the footnotes. And so maybe one critic of William's could say, well, look, you've talked about desires as though they're exhaustible. You can accomplish them. Once they're satisfied, that's that, right? But what about inexhaustible desires? Okay. Knowledge seems like something. The more that you learn, the more that you know that there's out there to learn love right if you're if you have a really great friendship or a really great romantic relationship that doesn't seem like something that you would just satisfy you want to continue that um self-improvement insofar as we're immortal but not perfect right then that seems that we still have things that we can improve upon these desires don't seem like they're exhaustible bernard williams some of these philosophers might say and I think, I, I don't know exactly how he would reply, but I think he would ask the question, do we think that those would really hold up in eternity? Right? And think about knowledge. If you're just constantly grinding at school, yeah, there's more out there to learn, but like, do you want to learn more and more and more? Maybe you've learned everything that you wanted to learn. Love and friendships, those are incredible. But also think about whether or not your love and friendships, uh, whether they are with immortals, you know, because your friends could die, your romantic partners could die, your romantic partners could cheat on you or leave you or something like that. There's a lot of stuff potentially that's also not an upside to any of that. And so if you're considering these as inexhaustible desires or inexhaustible goods, you have to like Consider them in all of their complexity to see whether they hold up, right? So the other challenge is to the second part of the dilemma, which is to ask, you know, so what? So what that our future selves have completely different desires and they, they look very different than we look right now. Maybe there's a good analogy here. In the way that toddler me was not, or let's say, not say toddler me, let's say like very young me 
I was interested in Ninja Turtles and eating pizza and doing Taekwondo and, and all sorts of stuff, right? I don't share a lot of those desires. I mean, I still love pizza. I still love pizza. That's probably the one that, that stayed consistent. But just because my desires now are different than my toddler's desires doesn't mean that my desires now are any worse, right? Or that I would try and insult my toddler's desires. Those were my desires then. That, that's great, right? So why would we as mortals be concerned about the desires and the projects and the things that we think about whenever we're immortal? Maybe it's like an adult looking back at a toddler, right? That's, that's what a critic of Williams might say. But here we're getting into like weird questions about personal identity or just existential themes. And what I mean by this is in eternity, if you were immortal, would you still be you? Would you be human? And obviously not in the sense of species, your species human, right? But in the sense of like who you are, how you think, the things that you value, how you operate in the world. Is something about that immortality going to change that in a deep and fundamental way? Right? So I think what Bernard Williams wants us to see with these examples is that we need our mortality. Which is a really interesting idea because a lot of people have psychological, psychological hangups with considering death. We often think it a very bad thing. We're afraid of death many, many times, right? It's something that keeps a lot of us up at night. Some people have to go to therapy for this sort of thing. And Bernard Williams is saying, okay, you know, all of that is fine. You know, work through what you need to work through. But also consider that our mortality is better than the alternative, which is immortality. Because our mortality, our finitude, it deeply interacts with our desires, how we choose among projects, how we enjoy things. And if we didn't have our mortality, if we didn't have death, a lot of aspects of our lives would be different and they'd be for the worse, right? So mortality gives our lives meanings. And that's, that's something that I think Williams wants us to come away with. The second set of, you know, ideas that I'm going to talk about are about a debate in medical ethics or applied ethics about physician-assisted suicide, which is also known as physician-assisted death, which, you know, used to have various other names. Physician-assisted death is basically, as it's practiced today, it's legal in about a half a dozen states. So Oregon, for example, has the Death with Dignity Act. And if if I were to have some sort of terminal diagnosis, meaning that, like, I get, let's say, stage four lung cancer, and it's not treatable, and I'm in excruciating pain, and the doctor gives me a prognosis, say, of six months to live, right? If I live in Oregon, then I can confirm that diagnosis with another doctor. So I have two doctors look at my case to confirm that everything is correct. And I go through a waiting period, I pass a psychological assessment, they come back and they check with me, you know, and I say, yes, I'm still, you know, certain doctor that I want to kill myself because I don't want to live all six months of my life left in excruciating pain, right? And so... They would give me a prescription uh, of things to take, uh, a medicine that keeps me from basically throwing up or regurgitating, and then a medicine that more or less puts me to sleep and, and kills me, right? And so that's what physician-assisted death is. It's legal in some states in the United States. It's legal for many other things in other countries, such as the Netherlands. Um, and that's, that's the debate. The debate tends to be, should physician-assisted death be ethical or legal, right? Uh, so we're not in a law class. We're not going to talk about the legality, but we're going to talk about the morality or the ethicality of it. Should it be okay for us to use something like physician-assisted death? Now, I kind of figure that 
you've heard a lot of arguments for why we shouldn't do that, why we shouldn't have physician-assisted death. So I tend not to cover those, and I didn't assign those for you today. Rather, what I'm going to do is to talk about two particular philosophers and arguments for why we should have physician-assisted death, because I think that it helps us to put our lives in a particular perspective. So the first philosopher is John Locke. Um, full disclosure, he was my doctoral supervisor. I really, really like this guy. He's as pleasant as that portrait makes him seem. He's an incredibly wonderful writer, and he specializes in medical ethics, among many other things. And one thing that John Locke really emphasizes in a lot of his writing is that we need to be careful about abstraction. Philosophical abstraction can sometimes lead us astray. And so if we're considering something like physician-assisted death, let's consider a particular case. And so that's why he brings up the case of Magda. And I'm just going to read it from, from the particular chapter that, that we uh, were assigned for today. So this is what he says. I will try to correct such vacuous abstractions by describing in considerable detail the ways and needs of a person seeking relief from existence. Her name was Magda, and she lived a long and rich life. She outlived a series of her physicians, all youngsters by comparison with her. She was massively healthy throughout her life. Two broken hips in her 90s did not slow her down, and at 101, she cooked and needed no help to take care of herself. Her husband died before she turned 70. As she aged, her closest companions also went to the grave. Undaunted, she made new friends and reached out to people she had known as a child. Over decades, she saw these buried as well. Eventually, only two or three friends remained, and they lived so far away that she could keep only in telephone contact with them. Although Magda had no life-threatening illness, her organs began to fail. Macular degeneration robbed her of her sight, and she lost much of her hearing. She learned to walk with a cane, then with a walker, and finally gave up on walking altogether, except for a step or two when someone would lift, steady, and support her. Her mind remained clear, which made things more difficult because she saw and understood how her life was closing down. A vibrant woman who loved life and enjoyed its activities, Magda resisted the closing hour. She employed every mechanical aid available to support her organs, but she had always been fiercely independent and did not find it easy to have to rely on others for decency was, uh, or have to rely on others for help with a growing number of activities. Her tendency was to offer help rather than to, rather than to seek it, and her inabilities took a heavy toll on her self-image. She said that she was angry because she could no longer even attempt what she used to do without effort. Magda understood how, as we age, the horizon narrows and the activities of life become impossible to sustain. But she thought it was an indignity that she could not take care of her own private functions and could communicate with others only with great difficulty. At 103, she suffered compression fractures and found that moving caused excruciating pain. Going to bed became torturous, so she learned to live and sleep in a recliner. She had to wear diapers and rely on her son to clean her. A mild case of pulmonary hypertension did not hold hope of terminating her life quickly. Living longer seemed to her utterly pointless. The pain, the indignity, the growing communicative isolation overshadowed, by, overshadowed her naive optimism and the joy she had always taken in being alive. She decided that she had had enough and she was ready to die. She had foreseen this possibility in her younger years and had stockpiled sleeping pills so that when the time came, she could commit suicide. But the pills disappeared in the chaos of her apartment, and she was, in any case, unable to leave her chair to get them. She decided not to eat or drink, 
but there was enough love of life left in her to make this a regimen she could not sustain. This leads us to the moral problem. Is it acceptable to provide her with aid in dying? Here is a more pointed way of putting it. Is it not outrageously wrong to let her shriek in pain and live disgusted with her condition for months and possibly years? It may be worth mentioning that this was the story of my mother. Wow. Right? Locks details her life, shows that she did a lot of really fantastic things. She lived into her hundreds, literally. And for most of that time, she was able to take care of herself and do lots of great things and really enjoyed life. But there came a point in her life, and she didn't have a terminal diagnosis, right? Um, she didn't have cancer or whatever else where maybe she could have availed herself of other options. And he says, look, in the case where she's constantly in pain, she doesn't want to be in diapers and have to make her son change her. She doesn't want to like have to take a ton of effort to do even the smallest things. And she tried to kill herself, but she like lost the sleeping pills and she basically couldn't bring, she couldn't like starve herself to death. She just didn't have it in her. And so given that she has this life, she wants to die, right? She is actively choosing to die. And she's in her hundreds and she liked life, but she doesn't like it anymore. She's like, I've lived long enough. I don't like what I'm doing now. And it's not going to get any better in the future. Do we think that it's okay for her to avail herself, or avail herself of medical resources to commit suicide? That's the question that Locks is asking us right? And ultimately, he's going to say, yes, yes, physician-assisted suicide is perfectly okay. It's okay. And he says this for a few reasons. You know, there are a lot of arguments that say that it affects meaning in life, or it affects, you know, quality of life or some sort of judgment. But he says, look, in the case of Magda, her past is secure. She's lived a hundred years. She did a lot of things. She lived through world, multiple world wars, you know, great depression, great recession. John Locke is like an accomplished philosopher. She got to see her son grow up and become incredibly successful and have children, right? Magda got to see a lot and that's in the past. And that's great. The future, like her committing a uh, physician-assisted suicide isn't going to change any of that. Okay, so maybe there's a present value that life has. And he says, no, like, look, look at her life, right? She doesn't like being in diapers. She doesn't like, you know, not even being able to lay down without being in excruciating pain. She doesn't like not being able to move around and do stuff that she likes. The present life has little value in a case like that. And future value, what do you mean future value? When you're in your hundreds and... Things are just going to get worse. There's no future value there. So he says, no matter how you look at it, this is a case where, you know, the value is not going to change. Her accomplishments and her best years are behind her. That's just part of being human. And we should allow her the dignity of being able to end her life on terms that she wants. And he says, moreover, if we take something like the value of human autonomy very seriously, so the ability of people to decide for themselves how to live their own lives, especially when this doesn't hurt other people. She doesn't have children. I mean, she doesn't have children that are dependents. She had an adult son who had a successful career. She doesn't have grandchildren that are dependents. Her son, you know, is, is taking care of everything. She doesn't have a job or anything like that. There are no sort of... There's no reason not to respect her autonomy. She's not hurting anyone else, right? So why wouldn't we respect her wishes to allow her to end her life? And Locks is also very careful to point out, we already have terminal sedation, okay? 
So terminal sedation is a term that can be used in what they call palliative care or hospice care, where basically a patient is in excruciating pain and they have a terminal diagnosis, so they're not going to live, right? They, they are not going to get better. And so then, rather than the goal of medicine being to cure the person, the goal of medicine becomes how can we comfort this person and allow them to basically die well? Well, a practice that's already accepted is something like, you know, Magda's in excruciating pain. Okay, uh, John, here is morphine or whatever else it is. You can give her pretty much any dosage of this, but I want you to know that if you give her a certain amount, it may depress her so much that she falls asleep and she quits breathing. So I want you to know, John, you are allowed to give her any dose of this. Because if she is in pain, right, you can give her this and, you know, she's developing a resistance to this and the pains are getting more severe, right? And if you give her this dose, she's basically going to die. So the understanding being, we already find it acceptable for people in these situations to basically take a lot of morphine or whatever else to end their lives because they're in such excruciating pain, right? Now, this is like a little bit of a gray area. You don't say that, you know, you can just kill someone, but this practice of terminal sedation, putting them to sleep and ending their lives because you're giving them so much of the painkiller, that's already accepted. So why isn't it, a, you know, a practice that, you know, in cases where there's a terminal diagnosis and a prognosis that doesn't last very long and this person doesn't have children or anything that depend on them, right? Why isn't it the case that we just outright say, it's okay for doctors to help someone commit suicide. And Lox is quick to point out, look, this, this isn't just suicide for any reason, okay? That's a different argument. This is suicide with certain diagnoses, multiple doctors confirm it, the desire is stable, right? You check in after a couple of weeks, the desire is still there. This is very, very different. And he also points out one of the reasons that physician-assisted death is so important is because doctors have a monopoly on ways to kill yourself with dignity. Doctors are basically the only profession that can prescribe the kinds of medicine that would end a life with dignity. Okay, we'll get to this with the next article. So John Locke really wants us to see you know, again, death isn't something to be feared. Death is a part of life. And in fact, there's a way in which whenever you don't allow someone to die in the ways that they want to die, you're doing something awful to them, right? The line, is it not outrageously wrong to let her shriek in pain and live disgusted with her condition for months and possibly years, right? So this is another example where you're saying, let's reconsider death, let's reconsider death. Because a lot of people have a prejudice against it, or they have these hurdles that don't allow them to consider all of the intricacies of a case like this. So John Hardwig adds to this. And he says, look, we all know of examples where death came too soon. Someone young dies in a car crash. Maybe there's a really early terminal illness. So, so pediatric medicine, medicine for, for children, it's full of cases like this. I have friends who are pediatric nurses and stuff like that. They see really heartbreaking cases. We're familiar with death coming too early. But he says, look, death can also come too late. All right? And I think that the case of Magda would be a case that he would definitely say is the case. And he says, I don't think that necessarily this is the best thing or that maybe there are better and more just ways of arranging society to where we can get around some of these things. But whenever someone has a terminal diagnosis, right, and they're excruciatingly ill, there are a lot of burdens that that person is placing on their family. So like, let's say that I get one of these terminal diagnoses. I'm going to take an emotional toll on my family. They're not going to like seeing me suffer. 
I'm going to take a caregiving toll. Someone in my family is going to have to take care of me. And that's going to disrupt their life plans. Maybe they have to quit their job entirely. A lot of people do this. Some people, you know, declare bankruptcy or whatever else because of this. A lot of people put careers on hold and it just disrupts everything. That can start to affect life a lot. And in America, because we don't have single payer, you know, healthcare systems like most of the other developed countries, we can put severe financial burdens on our families. And there's a lot of resources allocated to people who are not going to live for very long or can't be helped. And that's not a good thing. So this leads to a tragic conclusion, which is basically that sometimes the best things for our families is for us to die, right? And he doesn't like this conclusion. He doesn't think it holds often, but he says sometimes it's just the case that, you know, maybe in the case of someone like Magda, the best option is for someone to die. So we have a duty to live, right? We know about that. But in some cases, it also seems as though we have a duty to die because overall, we are costing a lot of people a lot of very significant things. And in cases where our life won't go on for much longer, and it's just going to be a poor quality of life. So given that, given that, what do we do, right? We have a duty to die, he says, or so he hopes he's proven. How do we die, right? The question becomes, who should kill me? If I have a duty to die, who should kill me? Should I do it myself, he says? Well, look, there's physical and psychological challenges to this. Sometimes whenever you're really ill, you aren't strong enough, literally, to, to kill yourself. But also just psychologically, uh, there are a lot of failed attempts at suicide. It's really tough to end up killing yourself, right? So even though you have a duty to die, it's going to be really tough for you to just end your life by yourself. Moreover, there's still a huge stigma attached to suicide. You know, uh, it will nullify insurance policies, for example. We don't think that, you know, it's a good thing. And I'm not saying that that's right. In fact, I think that's wrong. But that's, that's something that you have to consider here. And it's something that's also very... Uh, very alienating, and it makes you feel incredibly alone. Friendships and family and all sorts of things are really important to us. Yet with this, one of the most profound experiences of our life, choosing our own death, we're forced to do it all by ourselves and shamefully. And so he's going to say, look, I don't, I don't know. So we have a duty to die, but it doesn't seem like us just killing ourselves. That might not be the best option for all of these reasons. Okay, so who then... Who then should kill us, right? Well, what about loved ones? Our friends or our family, right? I'm terminally ill. I can't kill myself. So I go to my family and I say, look, uh, I'm not going to get better. And I'm not having a good time. Like, I'm in excruciating pain. I can't do the things that I love. And I know that I'm affecting your lives. I love you, but I need you. I need you to kill me, right? And he says, okay, that's a slight improvement because now we're socially connected at least. But first of all, there are legal questions. Would that be considered murder? Second of all, the psychological challenges don't go away. And so whenever I teach this in class, obviously I'm not doing this because it's online right now. Whenever I teach this in class, I, I just ask my students, would you, would you kill, your, kill your friend if they came to you and said, look, I have this diagnosis, I'm in excruciating pain, and I need someone to kill me, I can't do it myself. Would you actually do that? And it's usually kind of mixed. There are a fair number of people say, look, I'd, I wouldn't want that responsibility, even if it were legal, and I don't know if I could live with myself if I did that to my friend, okay? So we're kind of going through the options. It doesn't look like us killing ourselves is good. It doesn't look like asking our loved ones to kill ourselves is good. So who does that leave? Physicians, right? And for a lot of reasons, Hardwick says, this makes sense, okay? Doctors have a lot of understanding. They understand human anatomy. 
They understand how to kill people with dignity, respect, accuracy. They can get things right. They have the drugs to do this. John Locke's made the same point, right? You can just take pills. You don't have to do something like hang yourself or starve yourself to death, which is going to take a while anyway. You can use drugs that does it instantly and does it with dignity. Moreover, physicians are trained to deal with stress and dealing with death. And there's no stigma attached to doctors doing their job, right? In addition to all of that, doctors already have an obligation to help their patients. So whenever you consider, so he says, you know, the first part of the argument, it seems as though some of us have an obligation to die, right? And if that's the case, how do we fulfill that obligation? And he says, physicians are the best route for this. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this is, it's, it's legal in some states, right? In Oregon, I think also in Colorado and a couple of others. Um, but the question is, why don't we consider this a good thing? And why isn't it legal in all 50 states, right? And again, I think there's something to the psychological hurdle of us just clinging on to life and not really realizing that life doesn't necessarily have value if the quality of life isn't that high, right? And again, we can consider all sorts of issues of justice. Maybe we get something like single-payer healthcare system. Maybe we get make sure that people are all taken care of. But I think even in utopia, where life is perfect, um, we're still mortal and we should still have the opportunity to die with dignity. And I think that that's what the last two arguments kind of show. So the reason that I teach these, I, I think they're beautifully written. I think they're incredibly well argued, but this is a tangible case of how our ideas about death can influence specific policies and specific decisions that we make. And by the way, whenever, whenever you can, as early as possible, I would totally recommend that you have a will, that you discuss your death plans with your loved ones, what kind of life you would like and you wouldn't like. And if you could, you know, writing something like a living will or an advanced directive, which usually requires multiple signatures of people who, you know, have no conflict of interest. Maybe you go to a lawyer, uh, you know, when you have a career or you have money to do this sort of thing. But setting out basically like, look, if I'm ever in a case where I am not going to improve in my quality of life, I don't, for example, want to be put on a ven ventilator indefinitely on machines that help me to breathe, right? Or I don't want to have this sort of quality of life. It's okay, family and loved ones, if you have to let me go. Because in a clinical setting, it's really stressful to make these decisions on the fly. I mean, first of all, if I were, you know, in a life or death situation, there's a pretty good chance that I'm incapacitated. So I'm not going to be making this decision for myself. It's going to be a loved one. It's going to be a friend. It's going to be someone, right? And if I have discussed this with my friends and with my family, it's going to be stressful because they're losing someone that they love, but it's not going to be uncertain. They will know my wishes. My friends already know my wishes. And in fact, uh, my father went through something similar and he chose not to be resuscitated before he went in for a surgery. And so we knew um, basically his wishes and eventually he died recovering from the surgery. And it was obviously it wasn't great. Right. But the family <clears throat> wasn't conflicted about it. We knew his wishes. He talked about it with us. He signed his advanced directive. He told his surgeons and the physicians, right? Everyone knew. And it's stressful to face those decisions. So I think what Locks and Hardwig are trying to get us to do is to pay much closer attention to death and to realize that it's an incredibly intimate decision. It comes down to how we want to live our lives. And part of living our lives is deciding how we want to die and dying with dignity. And it should be allowed for doctors to help us with that process. Okay. 
So we saw how our mortality gives our lives meanings. We saw how our mortality basically is an intimate decision. It can help us in a lot of different ways. It can put our lives in perspective, right? And that's like the third, third uh, lesson. This is the final lesson, which is basically that death changes our perspective. Okay? Learning to philosophize is learning how to die. A lot of philosophers have said this. Why? Why is it the case that philosophers talk about death and they think that it's something that we should really spend a lot of time thinking about, right? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some examples. One is that thinking about death helps us to protect ourselves. So this is the Stoic philosopher Epictetus. And this is a saying from his book, The Handbook. He says, Let death and exile and everything that is terrible appear before your eyes every day, especially death. And you will never have anything contemptible in your thoughts or crave anything excessively. What I think Epictetus is trying to tell us here is that whenever we consider that we are going to die, whenever I consider that my dog is going to die, whenever I consider that my loved ones are going to die, whenever I keep death in mind, what it does is it puts everything into perspective. Look, life is full of a lot of bullshit, okay? Pressures about our career, pressures about our reputations, pressures about certain political things. There's a lot of stuff that keeps us from paying attention to what really matters. So we want to drive an Audi instead of a Volkswagen, right? Or we want to live in a certain side of town as opposed to the one that we live. Or we want to like upgrade our gym membership to a private club as opposed to the Y. You know, there's, and I'm not saying that to make fun of any of that. I mean, to a certain extent, I would hope that we live more simply, but also it's like we take some of this stuff so seriously that we forget what's really important in life, right? On our deathbeds, I can almost guarantee we are not going to regret working extra hours at work. Or, or we are going to regret working extra hours at work. Like, we're not going to say, man, I'm, I'm really glad I worked all those extra shifts at work, right? Our minds are probably going to go to our friends, to the projects that we love, to the stuff that we loved doing, helping people out, right? And I think that's what Epictetus is saying here. Whenever we think about death, it offers us protection against all of those temptations that can ensnare us and distract us from what really matters in life, right? If you keep death in mind, says Epictetus, you'll never have anything contemptible in your thoughts or crave anything excessively. Because you know that this is temporary, and you know that you got this shot in particular. Make the most of it, right? And making the most of it is going to look very different from someone who understands that they're going to die and someone who never thinks about it. If you live as though you're going to live forever, there's a chance that you're going to neglect certain things or you're going to put off stuff that you think is really important to you because you think you have a lot of time. Epictetus is saying, cut through all the bullshit, prioritize what's actually important. You aren't guaranteed any days, any moments. Live your life like that, right? Protect yourself against all of the stuff that we can get caught up in, right? So that's one argument for why we should think about death. Another Stoic philosopher, Marcus Aurelius, I think is going to espouse something like a virtue of gratitude, okay? And here's, here's his reflection. This is from his journal that turned into the meditations. So this wasn't meant for other people. This was just him reflecting on life. He was an emperor of Rome, by the way. So he's just trying to keep things in perspective. You could think about the life of an emperor and all of the meetings and all of the people flattering you and all of the enemies trying to assassinate you and all of those things, right? So he took time every day to make sure that he was doing his philosophical exercises and reflecting. And one theme that he often reflects on is death. So here's a famous passage. 
he says to himself, In short, know this. Human lives are brief and trivial. Yesterday, a blob of semen. Tomorrow, embalming fluid, ash. To pass through this brief life as nature demands. To give it up without complaint. Like an olive that ripens and falls. Praising its mother, thanking the tree it grew on. I chose this passage because I think it's poetic. The emperor of Rome, right? Arguably the last great emperor of Rome. He says to himself, lives are, my life is trivial, he says. Yesterday, I was a blob of semen. Tomorrow, I'm going to be ash. Which is like, those are some incredible images to choose for yourself. Especially if you're an emperor, he's saying, look, I'm nothing. I'm nothing. I was a blob, turned into this, I'm going to be ash tomorrow. Why think that way? Well, he says, look, it's like an olive that ripens and falls. Ripening. That's what aging is. It's okay for that olive to fall. In fact, olives are good whenever they age, right? That death, that ripening, that falling is really important really, really important. He says, it's like praising the mother and thanking the tree it grew on. Whenever we keep death in perspective, and whenever we realize that life is finite, what it should do is make us grateful for every single thing that we have and every component of our lives that we're sort of enjoying. And gratitude is one of those psychological characteristics, by the way, that is highly correlated with life satisfaction. People who are grateful, or even the small things in life, tend to enjoy their lives much better than people who aren't. So in, in other classes, especially in smaller classes, um, I like to assign a gratitude journal where I ask, you know, ask my students to pick up, you know, a small notebook, right? Uh, I use a little moleskin or whatever. And I ask them to jot down five things that they're grateful for every single day for a few weeks. Even doing something as simple as that, right? Even in the world where there's lots of really bad things, it can help. It just sets your perspective right. And I think that gratitude is a really important thing. Note, I am not saying not to be out there, not to, you know, not to strive for change. I'm not saying that you should just accept injustice. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that the practice of gratitude, the things that you can enjoy. So if you're struggling for justice, you're probably doing it with friends. Being grateful for those friends and those moments, seeing progress, right? Keeping that sort of perspective is something that can keep you grounded and keep you fueled to keep doing better. Okay? The last thing uh, that I'm going to say with respect to the history of philosophy is from Michel de Montaigne. And, uh, or Montaigne, Montaigne, you hear it pronounced all the, a lot of different ways. He's French, and he writes this in an essay called To Philosophize is to Learn to Die. And he says, We do not know where death awaits us, so let us wait for it everywhere. To practice death is to practice freedom. A man who has learned how to die has unlearned how to be a slave. Knowing how to die gives us freedom from subjection and constraint. Life has no evil for him who has thoroughly understood that loss of life is not an evil. So what Montaigne is saying here is that there's something about considering death that keeps us free. We can make better decisions whenever we consider our lives and our own mortality. Because think about, so this, this is not something he's saying explicitly, but to, to make sense of this, think about being afraid to die, 
right? And not just a little bit. I think it's perfectly normal to be at least a little bit afraid to die or curious or uncertain. I think that's perfectly healthy, right? But think about someone who's really, really deeply afraid to die. That's going to limit what they're going to do in life. This is why he says we unlearn how to be a slave. A slave is someone who literally is told what to do by someone else, right? And if your fears of death or your inability to consider what life is like or what your mortality is like, if those things are running you, that's not you. In order to reclaim those aspects of your life that might be influencing you without you even really knowing sometimes, you have to think of mortality. And once you realize that death really isn't all that bad, so Montaigne is reading a lot of the Roman uh, Stoics and people like that. He is versed in classical philosophy. So we can combine this with the Epictetus. We can combine this with the Marcus Aurelius. And we just sort of notice, like, look, death has its place in nature. It's, it's, it's natural. It's not something that we need to fear. It's something that has its place, right? And if it's my time, it's my time not something I need to resist. It's not something that needs to fill me with debilitating fear. It's just a part of life. And if I can face death and my mortality with that sort of level-headedness, that can help me to live better, to live freer. Okay? So I give those three examples because the essay that we read for tonight by Roy Scranton kind of draws on this. And Roy Scranton is an interesting guy. He was in the military, right? especially uh, during the Battle of Baghdad and related operations. He studied English, I think, writing and literature type stuff at the New School and then Princeton. And I think now he's a professor at Notre Dame. Just, just an interesting life, right? But I think that the essay on learning to die in the Anthropocene, I think it's gorgeous. I think it's really, really gorgeous. And... One of the things that makes this a moving essay is that he, he draws on some really deep, affecting things that he experienced. So the 2003 Battle of Baghdad, he describes rolling into Baghdad in the Humvee and thinking about all of his stuff, being in armor, thinking about the improvised explosive devices that people hit, thinking about, you know, that he would most likely make it home, but he wasn't entirely sure. And even if he made it home, maybe he'd have injuries. But in order to help his fear of going out there and doing his job as a soldier, he often thought to himself about his death and the different ways that he could die, getting sniped or whatever else. And doing that helped him be more calm and be more comfortable and face things more objectively, right? But he didn't just see that in different countries. He didn't just see that in military operations. He saw that during Hurricane Katrina, so when New Orleans was covered in flood water and infrastructure had collapsed and, you know, George Bush and others didn't do a good job of mobilizing federal supplies to help people out. There was looting. There was rioting. There was, you know, all sorts of crazy stuff that happened in situations like that. And he says, look, those are two examples, um, foreign and domestic, and they're not going away. Climate change means that more of these hurricanes and, and weather phenomena are going to happen, right? Uh, political instability. So if certain parts of the planet become uninhabitable, people are going to be moving to parts of the planet that are habitable. That's going to lead to a lot of problems. This is not going away, he says. And that's largely because the era that we live in today is the Anthropocene. And what the Anthropocene basically says is we are in an era where uh, that should be effects with an E, where humans are basically causing geological effects. Okay? Humans are no longer just impacting their own species or maybe just their immediate environment. We are doing things that affect the planet. So there might be disagreements about how exactly this is working or how to combat it, but there is large scientific consensus on the fact that human, human life 
is affecting the globe, right? Uh, global temperatures largely are on the rise, right? And this has been something we've seen for a while. But you can even take something like fracking. Uh, so I'm back, I'm from the Panhandle of Texas, right? Uh, there's a lot of fracking that happens in Oklahoma. I have friends who live in Oklahoma and they have earthquakes. Like, Oklahoma shouldn't be that geologically very active, but it is because of fracking. Humans are starting to do things that affect the planet. I mean, nuclear weapons are another great example. If someone were to launch enough nukes, we could lead to a nuclear winter, right? If you ever read or watched the movie The Road, um, it doesn't ever say exactly what happens, but that's basically what, what happens, right? It hints at it, and you can kind of piece it together. Humans have the capacity not just to change themselves, but to change the entire globe. And this is not going away. It's unique. We didn't, we didn't evolve to have this capacity. We didn't evolve in situations where we had to think about this sort of stuff on a global scale. But here we are, right? And so one of the points that he tries to hammer home is that the future is going to be unlike the past. We can't continue as we have. There's something fundamentally changing in the Anthropocene right? And so what do we do? Well, he says, look, philosophy, philosophy. And he says, philosophy isn't going to help trap carbon dioxide. It's not going to save the bees. It's not going to solve engineering things, right? But philosophy can help us existentially and ethically, meaning it can help us to make sense of our lives and what it means to be a life and what meaning in life is. And it can help us decide what right or wrong action is, or what is good and bad in life, or what makes for a good life. Philosophy teaches us how to die. This is a meditation on death. This is a meditation on death. We, we learned how to die, right, as, as, being, as, as a species. Death is like nothing new. But the death of an entire planet caused by us, that's new. And so that's kind of what, what he's puzzling over in this essay. And he says, look, the biggest problem we face is a philosophical one. Understanding that this civilization is already dead. The sooner we confront this problem, and the sooner we realize there's nothing we can do to save ourselves, the sooner we can get down to the hard work of adapting with mortal humility to our new reality. If we want to learn to live in the Anthropocene, we must first learn how to die. Why is that the case? Well, look. We as Americans... If we keep living as though we can build sprawling suburbs and we can drive huge cars and we can eat a ton of meat from factory farmed animals, right? And we can travel the world and, and order, you know, no rush shipping on everything such that air traffic is going around and we can keep launching satellites into space and we can keep you know, crowding into things without focusing on things like public health so that pandemics can spread. If we keep doing that, life is not going to be good. We need to realize that the way that we lived in the past, that's not sustainable. It's not good, right? We need to consider that that way of life, that civilization is dead. Which means that we are freeing ourselves to reinvent ourselves and to create new forms of life that can make sense of the Anthropocene, right? A lot of our values assumed that we could just keep on going on, we could draw on things in the past kind of like we have. And maybe we still can to small degrees, but he's saying largely that's, that's a foregone era. And if you just keep going through life like you've been going through it, you're done for. And it's not just that you're done for, future generations are done for. So if you plan on having kids, or if you have cousins or nephews or nieces, right? 
If we care about them, we need to care about these issues. And I think that the way that I would put this, I guess most pointedly, is that too many of us are dead before we start. We don't realize how dead we are. And I would tie this in uh, to the David Foster Wallace speech, This is Water, which we read earlier this semester. And, and Wallace talks about the insidious nature of the default setting, how we can go through life on autopilot, valuing things that we don't really care about, or the ways in which beauty betrays us whenever we age, the ways in which wealth betrays us because we never have enough, the way intelligence makes us feel like imposters, whatever it is, what we need to do is decide what our values are and be free because there are a lot of ways in which our values move us and motivate us without us even realizing that they're doing that and that they're bad for us. So in the age of the Anthropocene, where literally we can kill the entire globe, we need to come to terms with that. And the way that we come to terms with that is by saying the mode of life that we had in the past, it's just not going to work. We need to do better. We need to define ourselves in more ethical ways. We need more just societies. We need ecological justice. We need all of these things to try to become better. Philosophy teaches us how to die. It's scary to have to reinvent yourself and to have to say that the old ways of culture are forgone. That's super anxiety inducing. But again, philosophy can help inoculate you against those dangers. It can help you to think through things, consider the values, and try to consider what a good life is and what kind of values we should be abiding by. That's what Scranton and a lot of the other philosophers in this lesson are trying to get us to, to see, right? Death changes our perspective and it changes it for the better. So this is a pretty grim lecture, right? And I don't know, I, I still also find it incredibly beautiful. A lot of the writers who are talking about death and writing about death, they're writing incredibly beautiful and poetic passages because what it ends up being is whenever we consider death and when we, when we consider our finitude, we don't waste moments. Or if we have down moments at the DMV, for example, or whatever else it is, we can just like enjoy what we do have. We can enjoy what we have. And, you know, I, again, I don't want this to be trite self-help where you deny the role of justice. No, like fight for justice, right? Fight to be better. But, but between the fights, savor what you got, right? Savor what you got. And I wanted to end with a philosopher. Um, he is from Romania, but he was a French uh, philosopher really beautiful, poetic kind of guy, also very perplexing in a lot of ways, Emile Chiron, because in a lot of ways he wrote about suicide and he wrote about death, but this didn't lead him to be suicidal or to want to commit suicide, right? There was something about considering the grim aspects of life that he felt give him freedom and reaffirm his life. And so I just wanted to share this quote because I think it goes along thematically with what we've been talking about, but I also think it's really beautiful. And it shows that even whenever we're considering death or whenever we're considering that meaning is changing, that doesn't need to be something that fills us with fear or that fills us with, uh, with despair. There is still hope. We can define ourselves in certain ways. And I love how defiant this quote is, okay? So considering death, considering suicide, this is from a small essay called The Monopoly of Suffering. He wrote this when he was a very young man. He's, he's dead. Um, this is what he wrote. Why don't I commit suicide? Because I am as sick of death as I am of life. I should be cast into a flaming cauldron. Why am I on this earth? I feel the need to cry out, to utter a savage scream that will set the world a tremble with dread. I 
am like a lightning bolt, ready to set the world ablaze and swallow it all in the flames of my nothingness. I am the most monstrous being in history, the beast of the apocalypse, full of fire and darkness, of aspirations and despair. I am the beast with a contorted grin, contracting down to illusion and dilating toward infinity, both growing and dying, delightfully suspended between hope for nothing and despair of everything, brought up among perfumes and poisons, consumed with love and hatred, killed by lights and shadows. My symbol is the death of light and the flame of death. Sparks die in me, only to be reborn as thunder and lightning. Darkness itself flows in me. I mean, I just think that it's a beautiful passage. Um, he's obviously writing contradictory things. But what I take this to mean is like, even in darkness, even in meaninglessness, even in despair, there is something there. There is something there. We are there. And we can experience things. We can take them in. We can take the most intense experiences and be reborn by them and turn that energy into something creative. Human life is one of those things that has incredibly good things and incredibly bad things. And it's a really unfortunate thing that certain cultures, especially American cultures, right, only focus on the positive side of life. We should consider death. We should consider the ways in which we can kill the planet or kill ourselves. We shouldn't do those things. But whenever we reflect on death and our own capacity and suffering, it helps put things in perspective again, right? So I think that, you know, the lesson for tonight is just a bunch of reflections on death, but they're all unifying to say that, you know, it's normal to be afraid of death. It's normal to like shy away from it a little bit, but it's really important that we consider the dark aspects of life. Because if we consider death, what it can do is it can lend meaning to our lives. We can see that a lot of the things that we care about are possible because of our finitude, right? We can see that whenever we consider death, it can lead to gratitude, to freedom, to helping us to think more soberly and clearly about things. Whenever we think about death, it can transform us and make sure that we're living in the right ways. And so I think that that's kind of what is unifying all of this. Death is anxiety inducing. It is something that is uncertain for us, but it's something that we should be honest to. We should be, you know, hopefully we have friends or family that we can talk about this. Um, luckily I come from a culture, you know, uh, Mexicano culture, we have Dia de los Muertos, right? That just passed, Day of the Dead. We build altars and we pour, pour things out for our homies and for our loved ones, right? Those dark aspects, those aspects of death really help us to live well. And I think that that's kind of what I want us to come away with. So I hope that this lecture, despite the fact that it was morbid, despite the fact that, you know, it has a theme that upsets a lot of people, that it nonetheless leads to some good reflections and that just like this art by Okuda San Miguel, death does have a dark aspect, but it is something that can lead or, or lend vibrance and uh, vivacity to our lives. Thank you for your attention. I'll see you all next time.